Welcome to my two guests. We've got uh, Lyd King and Tessa Blackstone here. And um, I'm going to just briefly explain how this is going to work. Um, what we want to discuss here is we have a two-person debating team. Um, we're, da we're down to two people now. <laughs> um, we've got a, we've got a, we're going to have a little debate about um, universal language learning. And basically, it's um, should the, the, the discussion was, should learning foreign languages be a universal pursuit? And we have one person representing the dream and one person representing the reality. And guess which one's which? Um, <laughs> welcome to Baroness Blackstone, welcome to Tessa Blackstone, and welcome to Lyd King. Now, Lyd King, as many of you know, is um, from the Languages Company, director of the Languages Company, and I'm sure you'll have seen him on many panels as well. And also, um, Baroness Black Blackstone, who's Labour peer in the House of Lords, of course represents the dream in so many ways. But um, I'm going to let you two start off, and then we're going to have a bit of a discussion afterwards. So, Tessa, if you'd be so kind as to kick off in the, in the pink corner. Uh, can you hear me from here, or do you want me to I think you'll, you'll need a microphone, but whether you want to sit or stand is totally up to you. Can you hear me? Good. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lamb coming into the lamb's den here. Um, I'm not a modern language specialist, um, I'm not a teacher, um, and I'm not somebody who has been a great proselytizer for the teaching of languages in our schools or indeed in our um, FE colleges or our universities. Um, but I'm not somebody who believes, I want to really emphasize this, in monolingualism, um, nor am I anti uh, literature in other languages and the capacity to read books in other languages. Um, nor am I against the development of linguistic skills um, in young people or indeed in adults. Um, I certainly regret that more uh, young people and a higher proportion of the population of the UK neither re read, write, nor understand um, languages um, of any kind. Um, the two languages I learned at school were French and German, and I did them to A-level, so I'm not without some experience of learning languages. But I have to tell you, and I'm not normally too anecdotal in these sort of uh, situations, that I can honestly say that whilst I did read, write, speak, uh, and understand those two languages quite well when I was 18, and I spent a bit of time in both countries, especially Germany, um, I can do neither now. Um, nor have I, in my long career of over 45 years, honestly say that I have ever had the need to speak either of these languages, or indeed much of an opportunity to speak either of these languages. And that was as a professor, doing a lot of overseas travel and speaking around the world uh, and in Europe. Um, it was as a minister, um, as an educational administrator. And there's one simple reason for this. English is my mother tongue, and English is the world language. And I do think we have to really take this into account when we're thinking about this issue. It is exceedingly difficult to motivate many young people to learn modern languages when they are perfectly aware that they can get around the world and they can do a multiple of things in the global world as long as they speak, read, write, and understand English. Uh, and I don't think I'm particularly unusual in this respect of having done these languages at school but never really having, ha ha having the need to use them. But I do regret the fact that fewer young people choose to learn a, a language properly. Uh, but I think we do have to think why. Um, and I also do think we have to be much more realistic about what we can do to stem the rush away from learning languages. Um, we need to think, what are the problems that we have to overcome what are the sensible solutions and what are the silly solutions? Now, I'll give you an example of a silly solution. It's again an anecdotal one. I have a five-year-old grandson um, who's a bright little boy. I mean, I'm Bud here, I'm his granny. Um, <laughs> but in his nursery class, he learned Spanish. He then goes into his primary school. There's no continuity. He doesn't learn any Spanish anymore. Children of that age will forget anything they've learned within a few months if it's not continued. All he can remember now is hola and adios. 
Um, I think he can count to five. Um, and those will go fairly soon. Um, I think what we have to do is to be very careful also that we don't make too many claims about how important language learning is. Um, you can make some claims, but you need to look at the ones which stand up and those which don't. And there are many that are made that I don't think do. I think we have to have to ask the question, does everyone have to learn a language in our system? Um, and if they do, uh, which ones? Um, uh, if they uh, do, uh, which ones should, and which young people should and which ones shouldn't? We have to think about what the opportunity costs are of more English-speaking children being pushed into learning foreign languages. They have to give up something else to spend a lot of time learning a language, as I certainly did. And although there are employers who say, yes, we do want to have more people uh, who can speak the language, I can tell you as a former minister, we have employers who say, we want far more people who did maths at A-level. We want far more people whose literary skills in English are much better. Uh, we want far more people who've learnt how to be leaders. Do you want me to stop? No, no, the microphone. Oh, you want me to use the microphone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, don't imagine that this is the only cause um, as far as what takes up time in our schools and our colleges and even in our universities. Um, I think there are uh, particularly difficult questions in an English-speaking country um, which are not easy to resolve. And I, I would say from my own experience in both Australia and the United States, they have exactly the same problems as we do. We're not unique in this respect. It's very hard to get uh, children and indeed older people to learn foreign languages in, in any English-speaking country. If you want me to stop at this point, I will. Uh, uh, to give, but I can I come back to so make a few more. Back, we can come back, I think. That, for the moment, that yeah. is, I think that's probably given Lid a heart attack. Um, <laughs> 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 but um, let, why don't we answer that first of all, um, and then we'll come back. Yeah. Fine. Is, is this okay? Can, is this audible? Uh, fine. Um, yes, I think Rosie's got the idea that we're going to have end up in fisticuffs. I don't think we will, really. Uh, would you want some uh, aggression up here? It's just uh, a today program thing where yeah. you know, they want to... They we want all to disagree. Well, we will disagree, but I want to start off... Actually, I, I find that very difficult because uh, Baroness Blackstone won't remember, but there was a period when she was a minister when the funding for the organisation I ran depended on the views of ministers, so I probably got a habit of deference that uh, <laughs> is difficult to, difficult to shake. <laughs> Uh, I'm supposed to represent the dream, but I hope it will be a realistic dream. You're the reality, Well, I'm not sure. I, I, I was told I was the dream, which is an interesting, is an interesting uh, uh, comment. I want to start, though, by some things where we probably all agree. Maybe we can get those out of the way. Some reflection of things that happened earlier as well. Uh, I think we all agree that the UK is not great at languages taken as a whole. There is a linguistic deficit in this country of some kind or another. I think another thing I would like to say, though, is that I don't think this is a, and now I disagree slightly, that this is an English problem or an English-speaking problem. I think that Europe, and we've heard that from a number of speakers, not least from Christina earlier today, is facing a problem about the teaching and learning of languages in schools. And another thing that I would agree very strongly with comments made earlier is that we need to have data and facts to bring to this debate, because my view another occasion perhaps, we need to be really rethinking language education and we've had some indications already about the way that might go in Britain because we are in Britain but also in Europe. I think another thing I'd just like to state at the outset is that my experience has been of three administrations, so it goes back some time, and I think that all of them have supported languages in one way or another. I have met many ministers and secretaries of states and they have supported languages. Uh, so I don't think this is a party political, except in the sense that Bessie said so, that the change of policies is very disruptive. And if we could find a way for continuity, that would be something very important. The last government, for example, spent something like, I think, quick estimate, 300 million pounds supporting languages. So the question becomes, and that's one where we might want to engage, why don't things change? Why don't things change in Europe also? If the same number of people now in Europe profess to be able to carry on a language as did 11 years ago, more or less, 
what, is, what are the issues? Now, it's not genetic. You know, Milton, I think, said that uh, there, were the there was a problem that uh, we, we live in northern climes, so we don't open our mouths sufficiently enough to be able to grasp the southern tongue. Well, <laughs> I don't think that's actually the issue. I think there are, there are issues to do with English, to do with political attitudes. Uh, but the, the problem that we need to face is what should be done. Now, Tessa's argument is, well, let's be realistic. Let's give up. 30 to 40 percent, 20 percent, that's all we need. That'll do. Let, let them be the ones who learn languages. Two problems with that solution. Firstly, who chooses? How do we decide? You might be able to make a case for saying, business needs this number of those speakers, that number of these speakers. Who is to decide who they are? How will children know and how will they potentially unleash their talents and the new worlds that we heard about just 20 minutes ago and understand those new worlds if it's to be languages by selection? What are we going to have? We're going to have a group of people who do languages in privileged places and other people who do reading, writing, arithmetic and maybe cooking and something else. Oh, Maybe we do have that already. Maybe that's the danger of where we are going with our languages in this country. So I think there is a democratic problem with that argument. So that one doesn't become a dream, that becomes a nightmare. And secondly, as I, 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 I take to the arguments, and I take your point, we must be realistic, we must be real about what we're talking about, not make false claims. However, there is significant evidence, we've heard some of it earlier on today, about how language is not just a subject in school. Our language is part of our identity. Our, the, the first language we speak is part of that identity. In the 21st century, we are developing, whether schools wish it or not, plurilingual identities. Those are the children of our future. That is the children of the future to do with their identity, to do with their opportunities, to do with their understanding of the world. And we are to deprive children of that I think that we do that at our peril. I think it was Comenius who said that a, a society will be judged by the education it gives to its children. A restricted 19th century education is one where language is excluded. And to come back to the more utilitarian argument, we won't even hit those targets if we had imaginary targets of 20%, 30% of high proficient linguists for our business purposes. It would be like saying we're going to win the World Cup in football but only 20% of our children can play football. We don't know who the team is going to be. We don't know who the, the, what the pool is going to be. And that is the kind of restriction that would bring about. Now, I don't think I need to convince people sitting here. What I think I do need to convince you perhaps about is that we need to take this argument seriously. Because it is an argument that runs. It's a serious argument. It's not a superficial argument. And uh, it relates to some kind of reality. We have to be looking hard at the reasons why we have not been more successful. I think some of the answers we heard earlier, and so I won't rehearse them now, about what we teach, how long we teach, where we teach, and I think those are things that we might want to explore further. Thank you very much indeed. Tessa Blackstone, would you like to come back on that? Yeah, uh, I would. Um, I have a, a list of things that people claim, and then I'd just like to run through them very, very quickly, and then come back to the issue about, um, because I don't entirely disagree with you, um, on um, whether some children should never learn a language and others should. I, 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 it's not my view that it, it, we should ever restrict the opportunity. But it is said sometimes that all primary school children should start learning a foreign language. Learning a foreign language should be compulsory until the age of 16. Um, a level should be easier uh, with more high grades awarded. Universities should not stop teaching degrees in foreign languages. Um, teaching um, uh, for languages is vital to the success of our economy, uh, to all young people. Um, employers and industry and commerce are more likely to select young people with um, foreign language qualifications than those without them. I have a question about all of those claims. I don't think any of them are right, um, and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, uh, I don't think we can spare the language teachers we have um, and provide the resources we need to have universal foreign language teaching in primary schools. We are mi a million miles from it. We don't even have enough language teachers for our secondary schools. So I would stop straight away on that one. 
And, and also, the, uh, there is another big problem about teaching languages in primary schools. When we do it, we don't teach the same language to, to all children. Some do French, some do Spanish, some do something else. They arrive in their secondary schools and they find that they may have done a language that um, the other children haven't done, and they start again from scratch. It's hopeless to do that. Now, I don't object to teaching a little bit about learning languages at the top end of primary schools so that children understand what is entailed in learning languages. But I think to start doing formal teaching um, in a foreign language, once again, I say this, in a country where English is the mother tongue is very difficult. And I don't entirely agree with what you said earlier about Europeans being as bad as us. They're not. And the reason they're not is that they are utterly determined, uh, those who are involved in making policy about languages, that their children and their young adults should learn to speak English. Um, and that is what is taught as a first language in nearly every European country, and rather effectively, because children want to learn it. Even pop music is in English. Um, I, I also uh, think that it is right that every child in a secondary school should be introduced to learning foreign languages. So every, every child in their first two years, and possibly in their first three years, should be exposed to languages. You then said, how do they decide who goes on? Well, there'll be a lot of self-selection. Many children will decide they don't want to go on. They find it amazingly difficult, and they don't see the point of it. Um, teachers will have to play a part in some of the um, encouragement of those who do show that they have some talent and potential and the ability to learn foreign languages. And you know, parents may also be consulted too. I don't think, after all, children have to make choices about all sorts of other things when they get to the end of their third year, and I can't see why they shouldn't. So I don't disagree with the decision that Charles Clark made in 2004 to say that not every child in the secondary school has to do five years of teaching in a modern language and learning in a modern language. It didn't work. It was just not working. Um, the next point I would make is that uh, I do think we have to uh, do, and I know there's been a lot of talk about this today, um, a great deal to improve how we teach those children who do continue. Um, we have to be, I think, more effective at the job. And again, you know, um, again being anecdotal, I can see, you know, what happened to my own granddaughters. Um, one of them who did Spanish at A level. She never went and spent time in Spain except with the rest of her class for one week. What is the point of that? They all spoke English. Every child who takes a language at A level in this country, a European modern language, should go and be exposed to total immersion um, for a minimum of three weeks and probably for a month. But we don't do that. Lit, um, the last, last words to you. We do have to wrap this up, unfortunately, um, very quickly. Well, I, uh, last difficult. Though. It's a pity we can't involve the audience. I, in this I totally I, agree. I, I will just give a, when I get out of here, I'll call where I'm going next. I'm saying it's going to be 10 minutes late. Okay. So Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry this, well, this one uh, has I mean, to be I think short. It's, it's difficult because we've not, not really had enough time, but let's, we've accepted, we've moved on. So we're not now talking about whether everybody should study a language, have an opportunity to study a language, we've agreed that they should. The question is for how long and when do they start? How long is a very important question, because if you don't, if you, if you play around, I, mean, I remember somebody saying, well, they could do it for a year, and if they don't argue after a year, you wouldn't say that about science, would you? You wouldn't say that about maths. If you don't like maths at the end of three years, I didn't like maths particularly, give it up. Now, that is something about where language is viewed. So I think our, our starting point is how important is the study of a language, of, the lang of the la a language's curriculum, a language's education in school. I say it's fundamental that you also learn to do that's, that's where That's the starting point. If you agree that it's fundamental, then many of the other objections that you have uh, follow as solution, as, as problems to be solved, not as obstacles uh, to introducing languages. Of course, we need good teaching, and as Bernadette said earlier, we need much more opportunities for teachers to self-reflect and develop, because without that, 
uh, you will not get good language learning in school. Of course we need a good curriculum and we need more teachers and one of the things that I feel very strongly and having observed this over many years, we need to offer more time, not all of which needs to be in school, and certainly opportunities for that kind of uh, exchange and real contact. Most people I know make significant progress in learning a language outside school. That doesn't mean that the school experience is not important. It is the basis for them to be able to do that. Tessa, as you're staying with us a couple more minutes, would you like to yes, comment further? Um, well, on the subject of teachers, uh, again, I, I, I don't want to pretend I have a lot of expertise in this area. Could you just put the, microfo put the microphone a little I bit I have closer. spoken to teachers of foreign languages who find it absolutely soul-destroying um, to teach a group of 15 and 16-year-olds um, a language where they're making, whether it's French or German or Spanish, very, very little progress. They don't want to learn. They can't see the point of it. And I would much rather use the expertise of those teachers once you've got past of giving them all an opportunity for three years to really concentrate on doing it better with those children who do want to do this and who are um, able to grasp what is required to make progress. Um, you know, English is a relatively easy language to learn compared with French and German, actually. So it's like a bit tougher for British children. <laughs> no, 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 it's tougher for British children. I saw a Greek gender, lady there put her head in her hand. in German, uh, the four cases, the very, the very large number of regular French verbs. I've done that many, many years ago. Um, and it does require um, commitment, hard work, and industriousness. And, you know, not all children are going to show all of those things, although they may show it in mathematics or in science and in some other subjects. So that's another point about being realistic. Uh, but can I say one more thing about all of this? I'm very, very worried about the fact that people are now talking about A-level grades being too hard and we've got to lower the standards at A-level in languages. I think before we start doing that, we need to be very, very sure that we're not going to regret it later. Okay, thank you. Lid, I am going to give the last word to you. Well, I think the, uh, it's difficult, isn't it? I'm, I know what you're saying out, out there. Uh, the, the, it, it's where we start. If we start. And you haven't answered the point, actually, and obviously you won't now, as what, what is the role of language and language education within school? Some of us think that it's quite fundamental. If it is fundamental, then we have to solve problems. The problems we have to solve are some of the ones that you've mentioned, but I don't think we should shy away from those. But it's not, uh, things get, you, should, you could turn things on their head. It is not the problem of pupils that teachers are not teaching them well. It's the other way around. So if teachers, you would not expect somebody to spend three years doing something boring and then like to do it. So if that is what is happening, and in some places it is, then we have to look at what is happening, what is being taught, and also to support teachers to teach in different ways. Uh, not to say, well, we'll give you a terrible experience so that you can then justify giving up the language, which you probably didn't mean, but that's no, what I it don't, sounds I'm like. I'm not saying that either. I'm saying that I do want to come back to one final point and then I'll shut up. Um, we have to distinguish between children whose mother tongue is English um, from children whose mother tongue is something else when English is the world language. That is a very, very big factor in the motivation of children to learn languages. It's, it's just, it's, our, it's a curse for us. We, we are at a disadvantage in that sense. Although when I go to, to conferences with people who are absolutely fluent in English, they always say, we really envy you that English is your own language. You can write it, you can read it, you can understand it without having to work at it as we do. But no. nevertheless, we are cursed. Eng English we is are never going to go into language learning in the way that people would have to they didn't speak English. English is undoubtedly a very useful language to have, and many people want to have that language, but I, have, I don't know what parts of the world you... When I go out into the world, uh, have you been to the Ukraine, for example? I, c I couldn't yes. get anywhere in the Ukraine yeah. without a smattering of Russian, which I didn't have, or some bits of German. English was totally useless as far as Ukraine was concerned. It depends maybe what circles you move in, I don't know. Uh, so I, th I, th I think that case can be overstated, uh, but I think it still comes back to the more fundamental cases what is language for? And I think that's a question we all have to ask. What is language education for? Uh, and it is not just about being able to talk to somebody uh, uh, about the way to the bookshop. 
Thank you very much indeed. I'm sure it wasn't deliberate on the part of the European Commission to keep that panel the shortest, but... Um, <laughs> That, um, here, here on my notes, unfortunately, it was the shortest, but um, that could have gone on, and it would have been very, very interesting to continue that and to open up to the audience as well. But thank you very, very much indeed, Tessa Blackstone and Lyd King. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.